橘原さん Kenzaki is arrested by the guys in black, as Tachiban transforms to fight Peacock with Hajime watching. After Tachiban escapes with the convenient appearance of a street sweeper, Isaka speaks to Hajime in interest of joining forces. See, Isaka is curious about how humanity has grown in their era, and is conducting his own series of experiments, with him now in possession of Kenzaki to learn the secrets of the board writer system. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Oh no wait, that's an actual thing. The Hayflick Limit is the amount of times a cell can divide before it dies or begins to experience the effects of aging due to the shortening of DNA telomeres which, when the telomeres are too short to replicate, determine the point where cellular structures begin to abruptly degrade and die off, all of which is tied to aging. The Hayflick Limit is thus the hard limit inherent to all organic life. The reason why humans can only live to be a little over 100 years at most, and that cells themselves are not, and cannot be immortal. Thus, what this line which might have seemed like technobabble jargon, and trust me, I've seen it accused as such by the anti tavini Khan camp, is actually revealing that Kenzaki may possess a naturally longer lifespan than any other human, and this longevity may either be tied to why he was chosen for the board rider system, or a side effect to him utilizing the powers of the undead due to his unusually high synchronicity with the category Ace Undead card. This place is a madhouse! A madhouse! How the fuck is there a lens flare inside of a building like this? The directors for this show thus far have been Hidenori Yoshida, Nobuhiro Suzumura, Takao Nagaishi, and Satoshi Morota. I am familiar with the work of all four of them and the later director Kenko Sato for projects both before and after this, and none of them ever committed this sin in any work outside of this show. Seriously, what the hell is with their obsession with blinding the audience in this entry? Shuri and Shirai come across Tachibana as he recovers from the fight, both talking to him about his self-caused mortality and the fear causing his illness. Despite a rather well-spoken speech from Shirai, he doesn't believe a word they say, but on mulling it over, decides to help him rescuing Kenzaki. Kenzaki himself is forced to fight the Trilobite undead so Isaka can get data on his abilities, and effectively he synchronizes with the undead's power throughout the battle. His fusion coefficient rising in anger, after he sees Aikawa watching. His response to that makes him run wild, forcibly changing. Clearly the response of many fans at this point in the Heisei era's run due to how toys mucked up their legacy. I direct you to my previous statement. When Shuri thus detects that Kenzaki is surrounded by three undead at the same time, they panic, insisting Tachibana rush to help him, as Isaka notes how much power Chalice is drawing out as well to battle Blade, and amused by it all. <laughs> But as Garen arrives, we once again see how Tachibana's feedback loop is screwing him over. His fear of dropping that same fusion coefficient that determines their battle ability, leading to him once again losing the power to use his category Ace card. I really should have a meme face counter for this show. Despite the critique-worthy stuff in here, I'm surprised they'll have a good time with it due to the unintentional camp. But who should save them? But Karasuma, coming in to provide a distraction, allowing Blade to smack Chalice in the face and rescue Tachibana.
And to think, it only took them eight episodes to show off that finishing move. Chalice, however, senses that Isaka left a bomb at the Kurihara's restaurant, causing him to break from battle and run off. This allowing the board riders to escape with Karasuma in tow, as time runs out. Karasuma explains what Isaka was after and why he's been running from both sides. Isaka wanted to develop his own rider system, interested in using Karasuma's own research to create something superior through his own more intimate knowledge of an existence as an undead, and how Chalice seems to possess his own variation naturally among his own powers, all so he can have an advantage in the battle fight among all the other undead, which Karasuma now elaborates on fully for the audience. The ceiling guards were only a deterrent, though. They still lived inside them, bored deciding to unlock them as they thought they were keys to immortality due to their undying nature. Karasuma thought it a bad idea, but went along with it, as Shuri's father caused the entire mess therein. Not every undead was released, though. The Category Ace cards they had on hand and their initial battle cards were not ones unsealed. Thus, what they used as the basis for the system and how they'd be able to fight back. So it's not exactly an even battle fight as it would have been otherwise. But this conversation gets Kanzaki to realize that if he was surrounded by three undead back there, and Isaka's one, then that means Hajime must be the last one. Showing once more he's not an idiot as he connects the dots to Hajime's prior conduct as Chalice. The two cross paths in fight, Chalice and overtaken by bloodlust and just wanting to brawl, no matter the opponent. Tachibana, however, has become consumed by his own fear, unable to use the Gatoran belt anymore to fight, going off on his own to find something new to dedicate his life to, possibly that involving going out with Sayoko. However, his wish to return to normality is prevented by the zebra and dead attack in the mall he's at while Blade and Chalice are fighting. Okay, that's just a cool visual. However, upon seeing a parent murdered by the zebra, Tachibana, despite Sayoko trying to get him to run, realizes he has to stop up as no one else is coming. Him doing so stalls enough so Kenzaki can break off from fighting Hajime and show to the scene to deal with it himself, forcing it to withdraw. They lose the signal... because... leading Isaka to track it down himself in an effort to ally with it, but as the lower tier undead are kind of stupid, it just attacks him, to his displeasure. Kenzaki gets chewed out for keeping secrets about Hajime from them, even though he really didn't. He only just realized Hajime wasn't human. After seeing what being a writer is doing to Tachibana and causing his illness, Sayoko offers to quit being a doctor if he'd fully quit being a writer, so they could just run away together. And he actually seems to consider it, at least until Isaka approaches him, still looking for a partner. He offers to help him through his illness and fix the writer system so it wouldn't feed back from his fears, but Tachibana refuses, having no interest in allying with an undead. So Isaka reveals his true form, and it actually looks pretty good. If only the freaking cinematography wasn't crap. But ultimately, he can't do it. Even if it costs him his life, Tachibana can't stop fighting. Thus he loses, and Isaka takes him to submerge him in a tank? I feel like we've overdone that cliché. After treatment, though, he wakes up out at a shipyard with Zebra after him, Isaka in his head saying he can fight now, with Garen tried it out, and as Isaka observes with a fusion-level reader, it does seem to have worked. Though with how they kept saying it was mental, you can read this one of two ways. This treatment was a placebo, or there was actually something wrong with him the professionals just ignored. Neither is a good thing, as if it was a placebo treatment, then Isaka did something else to him. And if he actually was sick, then those close to him were incompetent. Zebra's cloning power, however, is concerning, making Tachibana finally cooperate with Kanzaki and Shiori 
by giving them data on it to analyze, with them all finding that the original glows when the clones are acting independently of it, which is the key to getting past its powers. And Kazaki's ecstatic to finally be able to work together. Thank you. Dear Aura, that's informative about Kenzaki. And finally, someone that gets it! Kenzaki's shown training with the Shinai to get better at fighting, but everyone seems to amuse on how Tachibana seems... odd. Him racing off to fight Zebra again, and getting into a surprisingly good bike brawl that... we just don't see anymore. Reason being why we don't see them much anymore, being changes in laws about custom vehicles, preventing them from doing much with them, sadly. However, the oddity in Tachibana's actions is all explained by him wanting to make sure his body is actually fine now. Rider Punch! And yeah, with that not weighing on him now, he's a lot less of a jackass, and more open to collaboration. Hajime encounters a group of street gangsters beating up a musician named Jin Ichinose, who after being rescued takes a shine to the undead man, and over a few episodes, bond, it allowing Hajime a chance to express why he's become attached to the Korihara's. Flashing back to upon finding the missing unit of their family dying, he became curious on the meaning behind the man's last words about the two. And over time, that question has led to him becoming attached to them. We really needed clear context to that a while ago, but it is something also in part delivered in prior content, so ultimately it all feels repetitious. Tachiban also tells Sayoko the good news about him being cured, but Sayako's now more worried than before about him staying involved in the conflict. However, Sayako finds a clump of something stuck on him, which only furthers her fears. Isaka comes to Shirai's farm as Kenzaki and Shiori are helping transport... milk... for Shirai's personal stores. The dude drinks an insane amount of the stuff, to the point it's even in the opening credits. It's actually seen as an odd character work for anyone to stomach milk in Japan as, well, 90% of the Asian region is lactose intolerant, Japan itself charting up at 98%. Really, it's actually only those from the European continent that have developed the enzymes to process milk. If you descended more recently from Africa or had ancestors go through Asia, you're far less likely to be able to process milk after infancy. Still, Isaka's not here for a fight. He's interested in giving the same kind of upgrades he gave to Tajibana to Kenzaki, which is refused. However, as they fight, Isaka feels that part of what he did is allow him mental domination over Tajibana, calling him to assist him and take up the fight so he does not need to, trying to use them as his own personal proxies in this war so he doesn't need to fight the other undead in this conflict at all. <laughs> Well, Hajime continues to follow around Jin, trying to figure out what to do, now that his identity as an undead has been outed, he finds himself stalked by the other undead, engaging Jaguar, which Jin sees, outing his identity to yet another person. This episode, by the way, is titled The Whereabouts of Each, so one could say they're seeking the whereabouts of truth. I feel like I'm making it a mission to sneak a dot hack reference into every review now. Isaka's control over Garen destabilized when Shirai and Shirori intervene in his beatdown of Kenzaki, annoying Isaka, which is then obscured by goddamn lens flare. Hey kids, how would you all like it if for a full season I constantly had this pointed into my camera? Would you think that painful and obnoxious? Well, that's how I feel about this show's cinematography. The dude who's weakening control, Isaka managed to maintain enough influence over him to shove him in the tank again, where he's exposed to more of the plant which makes him suggestible to his will. Well, 
Sayaka tries to get an analysis of the piece of the plant she grabs, but all they can figure out right now is it's to a long extinct species with a neurological side effect from exposure to it. Hajime senses both the spider and jaguar undead encounter each other, jaguar running in fear of it, as spider is a category ace undead. He, however, can't intercede as he's busy with Jin. As Jin meets his father Yu, the original sub saying it's Yuichi due to once again how bad the acting is in this show, causing there to be no pause in the stating of his name, just the entire thing said as Yuichi no Sei, despite his first name being Yu, so it should be said as Ichi no Sei, Yu. And again, understandable mistake due to the bad performances in this show, as just from hearing it, I almost didn't catch it and heard it as Yuichi, and I'm someone who's neurotic about names in these shows. But the two have a bad relationship, as his dad thinks his work is crap, and should be giving it up to help him cultivate actual talented artists. To the point on a TV broadcast, he calls out the crap of street performers, and uses Jin as an example of that. Please, did you guys actually hear his music? <laughs> That's actually pretty decent work. Certainly better than Gnome Kneels, and it's not like he created Spick. <laughs> Again, I have only myself to blame. Sayoko, however, is stalked by Jaguar under Isaka's orders. Kanzaki happened to save her and sealed Jaguar as another spade card as a result. While Tachibana, in turn, is ordered to take on Spider, as Isaka needs a Category A Sundead for his own project. But Spider is far too great a challenge for him. <laughs> See? This is the problem with the card system, even though it's comparably more accessible than the others. They still need to break from battle to slot a card, and it's difficult to do against something that would be trying to kill you. Now, picture if this was Ryuki. No one in that show would have ever been able to slot any card in a real battle situation, and it is again why I call that series stupid, as that would have subverted entirely the writer war if they did that to steal antagonist contract cards. It takes Kenzaki backing up to even try to slot one, but Spider escapes before he can, Garen chasing after it. Shira explains the relevance of the category Ace monsters. They're the ones they use to transform, making them realize Isaka's goal of creating a new writer system as another proxy. The Shell Undead attacks elsewhere, Hajime engaging it, but we see a bit more to the puzzle of him. It reveals that he doesn't actually have a human form he changes into. Rather, all of Chalice's forms are defined by his own personal Rouse cards. Chalice is the form of his Category Ace Change Mantis. His human form is that of the human undead. Meaning in this whole battle fight, as we have been told, humanity's representative in it has already lost by being resealed. This is massive, and yet, as presented, it's an afterthought just answering how Hajime assumes human form. Though right after this, Yu tries to corner Hajime about how he seems to be acting as Jin's bodyguard, trying to pay him off so he can try more direct methods to get his son back under heel. Hajime ignoring all of that as Jin, in his own way, is helping him work through his issues by giving him another perspective on humanity he's trying to figure out, even as he also tries to distance himself from him after Jin's learned his secret of being inhuman. That Jin in turn doesn't think matters as he's trying to help people in a shot overridden by goddamn lens flare! I know I'm being repetitious at this point, but come on people, how hard is this? But the Shell Undead attacks again, Chalice fighting it off. <laughs> and it makes Jin turn on him, as it destroys the boat he'd put so much work into earning through his music realizing too late that Hajime is trying to warn him this would happen, and harming Hajime to the point any progress is lost, making him decide to turn back to a life of solitude. Kenzaki and Tachibana once more fight Spider and fight over possession of Spider, but while they're occupied, 
Isaka comes after Sayoko himself as she finally gets a lead on what plant this is, warning her to stay out of this, or otherwise he'll kill her. Still, she delivers the details. The plant is a drug that improves one's fighting instincts, but over time destroys their nervous system, making them revert to more base instincts and forget anything more than the fight. The spider undead the following night releases a wealth of golden spiders, marking children he could have commonalities with, leading to Isaka kidnapping those marked as potential candidates for his rider system, Hajime and Kenzaki both following that lead to the same presumption. They're working together. Why, though? Tachibana's trying to capture Spider so Isaka could use it. Why would Spider hand him a candidate for the system that could sync with it if he had no intention of being sealed and would want to use the candidate himself? Remember, the undead are all out for themselves to win this war. Isaka's trying to make a proxy fighter so he doesn't have to get involved. And if Spider is sealed for use in the rider, he's out of the game. Spider, however, finds his eventual preferred user, a teenager named Mutsuki Kamijo, who he declares to be Liangle. Izaka's pawn the lion undead, and then coming after them. Mutsuki is actually a pretty polite kid in this first introduction, grateful to Kenzaki for saving him, and acting kind of adoringly. But Kenzaki's hope he'll now stay out of this all is in a future that will come to pass. Isaka finds all the candidates he's abducted won't be of use, as Tachibana's condition begins to deteriorate. Please. The ultimate undead is Shindan Krotoshin! <laughs> Though as the group have a party for Amane, it happened to be her birthday, she wishes Hajime will come home soon. She'd spent the last few episodes trying to get Hajime to come back home. Kitsaku when they last met, passing that wish along. But Hajime doesn't understand why, even as he can't get the image of that little girl out of his head. Spider is detected up in the mountains, but an undead appears near a hospital, it taking priority for Kenzaki. I really do like these characters. It's not their fault the storytelling isn't good. Seriously. If it seems like the recaps this time are a bit disjointed, well, I can't help it. Half the time, I don't have a clear understanding of what the hell is going on, as it keeps jumping rails constantly. Events are happening, but even according to the show, there's not a grasp of why they're happening. This isn't even a translation thing as long as the cues of TVN's original subs either. This has been a problem endemic to the show since its premiere. Without the grounding for a lot of these points, you keep having the problem of not grasping what's important. I haven't really had that problem before. However, as Tachibana is sent after Spider, Hajime stops him, refusing to let Isaki use Spider for his own purposes to get around the battle fight's rules. Still, with Lion beaten before and Blade so easily sealing his Rouse cards, Lion has no chance against him. <laughs> God, that running. I I know this was 2004, but was was that supposed to be serious? That's some of the worst running in place green screen animation I've ever seen. It's it's like a really angry power jog. Poor Seiji to Kaiwa. This really explains why this was, to him, the most difficult role of his career. I mean, I've commented on the issues of the effects work of this era, but the ones in Blade a lot of the time are just uniquely bad. Don't get me wrong, I love the transformation field effects, and I'm glad those got carried on into later shows. But that's pretty much the only thing that isn't Terra bad here. And we know Toei can do better. They did better with Faiz's effects in part because of how restrained their use was. Whereas here, it's in a lot of episodes needlessly, and doesn't do them credit. Though once again, at least they're so bad, they are hilarious. Isaka backs up Garen in fighting off Chalice to get to Spider. 
And KO's Hajime, allowing them to reach Spider once more. All while Sayako in her research finds, left oddly in her lab, a piece to a puzzle. With Lion Seal, Kizaki races up to the mountain, only to find Hajime collapsed in a ravine, rescuing the man and setting him up in an abandoned house. Why is Kizaki being nice? Well, it ties back to Amane's desire to see him again, and his own conduct in helping people making Kizaki see that he's not a horrible person. So, why not help him if they, in the interim, have the same goal of stopping people from being hurt? The problem is that's going to weigh on him when they eventually get to the day they need to seal him. The others, however, don't see that, just him being an undead. But in the interim, with Spider and Isaka both being more active threats, and the active evidence of him being a protector of people, Kanzaki is smart in not treating him as an active antagonist. It's not his fault, as Shirai says, that the undead attack him and anyone near him, as he does try to keep them out of it. Spider spreads more of his spiders as he kills others, as Sayoko finally pins down the plant he's been exposed to, Schuld Kestner Seaweed. Yeah, that's... not a thing. Or, if it is a thing, literally everyone that's tried to translate the series screwed it up, as outside of Counter Blade showing up in search results, I can't find it anywhere. I even pulled the show's original transcripts, tried differing potential translations of the phrase that anyone else has made use of, and got nothing. The only thing that is true about this is that certain types of seaweed do have poisonous effects which in the short term act as placebo cures for other conditions. Though, to date, there is still debate on whether the types of deadly seaweed are lethal because of actual toxins in them, particularly bad types of iodine the body doesn't process correctly, or from bacteria native to them which... yeah, bacteria infecting the brain has been known for causing changes in personality. Again. I am a former chemistry student that studied this crap. And it's going back to the good side of Kamen Rider in that what they're saying causes a condition could happen legitimately in real life, just not necessarily the way they're stating it to. Anyways, she tries to get him to stop, but he refuses. To him, it's making him feel complete. Kazaki keeps finding more people attached to the spiders that Isaka tries to claim, a spider begins drawing everyone away from its children that are actually forced back to Mutsuki. Hajime recovers, discussing Isaka's likely plans with Kenzaki, before thanking him for his kindness. But Sayako's attempt to get through to Tachibana was Isaka's last straw, deciding to just straight up murder her with no concern that this might screw over his plans. Not like he's concerned about that right then, as Tachibana succeeds in sealing Spider at last, only for Tachibana to refuse to turn it over. This would have been a badass reveal, that he hasn't actually been taking and fooling everyone to get a leg up on Isaki and learn his intentions, but... Yeah... No... He's still doping. Thus, he loses the change card to Isaka, taunting him that the only reason he has power is his treatments, and such a rider was never going to be able to beat him, thus why he was the perfect pawn. Thus, Tachibana is back at square one. Or rather, even less than that, as he finds Sayoko as she nears death's door, hugging her as she dies, and finally realizing what he's lost in his blind pursuit of power. To complicate things further, Hajime finds himself with another stalker, one he's been sensing intermittently for some time. The dragonfly undead that, to draw him out to battle, has kidnapped Haruka and Amane. When? This kind of seems like it comes out of nowhere. Kizaki backs Chalice up, Hajime holding off dragonfly as he rescues and evacuates the mother and daughter bit. Okay, it was sunset in the previous part of the scene. How is it full on nightfall? Wait. Did Kronos travel through time and start screwing with the day-night cycle again? 
Space is warped and time is bendable. I'm skipping past the resultant argument of whether Hajime was responsible for engaging or saving them. It goes to the expected cliché. What's more interesting is Tachibana crawling back to Isaka and destroying the seedweed tank. Isaka cost him the woman he loves. There's no way in hell he'd ever touch anything born of this monster again. I'm acting! Erupting! Burning! Finger! Isaka flees. His researchers realizing Tachibana's new wish for revenge might have finally led him to overcome the fear restricting him, and put him on the peacock's level. But Isaka isn't worried, as he still has his... Trump card. You have no idea how long I've been waiting for that punchline to come up naturally. Tachibana tells the team the bad news, and when asked, he does admit that this is now all in the name of revenge. Of the guilt and worthlessness he feels about neglecting Sayoko. <sighs> Sarah tries to reassure him that that isn't all he has. The love Sayoko felt with him will carry on, but it doesn't seem to carry since, well, she doesn't have the first-hand experience with it. Isaka completes his own rider gear, the Liangle Buckle, his scientists using it on one of their abducted victims, but they too lack the compatibility with Spider to be able to resist the change. They're all dumped, with the one they found that has the highest rating, Mutsuki once more, racing to try and meet his girlfriend for a date that he missed at the Kurihara's Cafe. As he realizes how much trouble he's in, Hajime finally decides to come back to Harakanamane, Kizaki's past words finally reaching him. Hajime's return panics Shirai, Kizaki walking him down for the moment to take a wait-and-see approach, but before they can all get together to discuss this, Isaka is detected by their scanner abducting more candidates for his driver, with Kizaki finding that Isaka has fully taken over Karasuma's mind, allowing Tachibana to have it out with the peacock. He succeeds in sealing Isaka, being the first to take hold of a Category Fusion Jack card among the riders, and with his defeat, all his thralls wake up from their hypnosis, Karasuma immediately realizing what happened. However, in the aftermath of all this, Tachibana has decided he's had enough, turning over Liango's belt back to the recovering Karasuma, finding himself unworthy of wielding it after everything that's happened, now that he's back in a right state of mind. You know, Tachibana's been a dick for a while, but he can't say he couldn't understand where he was coming from and does make clear the infighting wasn't personal. Still, Shirai thinks this might be a good thing. Maybe he can suit up and support Kenzaki to protect his family. But Kenzaki refutes that, as it's not that simple to suit up. And worse, he wanted to do it with the Liangle Buckle, which they have no idea the capabilities and danger of, since it was meant to be subservient to the will of an undead. <laughs> Oh, that cannot be good. And sure enough, the belt goes missing. <laughs> God damn it, Kenzaki! Sure enough, Shirai's being mind controlled by Spider. Turns out Tachibana didn't steal the card properly, and it can exert its will on those beyond it. Suddenly, arachnophobes the world over become fearful their fundamental reality has changed. However, from all of this, the belt is knocked far away, and if someplace someone is more likely to pick it up, which makes absolutely no goddamn sense. However, with things quieting down, what they now need is more tangible information on the undead than they have to potentially get a lead on how to stop the remainder out there, 
Karasuma heading off to Tibet and out of the show for a while. Tachibana is haunted by memories of Sayako, crossing paths with Muski, who's having problems with his girlfriend because of what he was drawn into that she doesn't believe at all. In the process, he stumbles across the buckle in what is clearly Plot Convenience Playhouse, as this cafe is nowhere near the Shirai farm. He's enthralled by Spider's power, touch about catching the sleight of hand with the driver, realizing Isaka's machinations might not be done. And sure enough, Mutsuki is fully taken over by the Spider's power. Kenzaki and Shiori try to insist Shirai play nice with Hajime, and the Undead Rider could supply them with the wealth of information on the Ed Dead, they just don't possess, so they can finally fight on an even level with their enemies. But it's a hard sell due to the danger he brings to them. Hajime is also not in a talking mood, as Dragonflies continue to stalk them with its minions. Chalice finally choosing to confront it in a crowded restaurant, which they entirely demolish. I hope this place was covered by their kaiju insurance. This is the drill that will pierce the head. <laughs> oh god, these effects. However, as Kazaki tries to see if they can work together, it's time for a new debut. Enter Liangle. Ridiculous thing that I'm ever gonna do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. That's it. Stop recording. Yeah.